All right, we're going to go ahead and kind of get jump right in, get started. Um, we, I'm going to be off today because I set my Bible down somewhere today and I cannot find it. So I'm using a different Bible, and I've got hundreds of them, and I've got this Bible, and I didn't know which one I wanted to use, but when it's not the Bible you're like, you've been reading and studying out of, I know, but it's not my Bible. I mean, I got a phone, I've got a tablet, but it's not my Bible, Does right? Does it still say the same thing? It says the same thing, but there's something about, like, knowing where it is on the page and, like, my spits on it, because, you know, you know, you get marked stuff. it. Yeah. So, if I'm off, blame the Bible. <laughs> All right, so we are starting tonight, um, getting into more of our New Testament. Last week we talked a little bit about, and I wanted to introduce you guys into some of the Old Testament usage of the New Testament, how the Old Testament and New Testament kind of come together. And uh, I'm not going to go too much more into that. Like I said, I, I have more information than probably anybody really needs to have on these sheets. But, you know, more is better than not enough, right? <laughs> So I'm going to try and be a little more concise tonight, but I want to start with, we're going to jump into the Gospels. Why, when you're reading your Gospels, what are things you pick up on if you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What are some things that may stop and give you pause as you're reading and comparing the Gospels to one another? Huh? The genealogy. The genealogy, in the sense of meaning they're different? Well, yeah, one go from, um, well, I guess it, I, I understood that it was from Mary's uh, side, and then the others from Joseph to show that he actually is the king. Yeah. And, I mean, that's a... Discrepancy, in a sense? Yeah. yeah. It, Two different genealogies? So one thing that I notice is all the things that are the same... And then one thing that I notice is all the things that are not the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> well, and so there's a lot of similarities. Did I spell that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yay, everybody clap. <laughs> all right. So there's a lot of similarities. And especially between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Those three are normally called the synoptic gospels, okay? And because they usually follow a more similar, not pattern, but they have the same stories. They talk a lot of, a lot of where they interlap, or they, they overlap a lot, and where they overlap, it's very similar, okay? Now, John, he gets kind of put off in his own little category, and a lot of times he doesn't even get included in the synoptics, because he really, even there's a lot of John stuff that's not even in the other three. It's only found in John. And he's not doing the same thing. My question is, what does that tell us about each individual gospel? What can you surmise by, okay, we're all talking about who? Jesus. We're all talking about Jesus, right? I mean, how many stories of Jesus, right? If you're going to tell a story, why don't we just need one of them? Why couldn't we just have one person give us the entirety of the life of Jesus? Same reason that you don't have one witness to an accident. One what? One witness to an accident. Okay. Well, let's need... say let's say all four of them signed it. You know, let's say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John came together and they and they all signed it. Because it gives you but, different perspectives, and they yes. were speaking to different audiences, different, different, audience. audience. different life different experiences. Speech. Okay, yeah. perspectives audience right different audience anything else i think it verifies the validity of the stories that actually happen if there's that many people like same thing but all these different perspectives of the same story yeah and that comes from kind of like <laughs> the apologetic side of it what happens when stories line up too perfectly like you know you're going you're asking and you're in a classroom let's say you're a teacher and you've left the classroom for a moment and you come back in and you notice something happened yeah and you come back in, and the stories are just almost as if they're rehearsed. Does that bring more validity to the story, or does that cause you to question things? And so a part of one of the cool things about the Apologetics of the Bible is that it's not so 
neat and tidy and perfect. A lot of people use that as an attack against it, which you also have to deal with the discrepancies, okay? Discrepancies automatically don't say, well, it must be real because there are discrepancies, but discrepancies actually help us to uncover that this wasn't just one guy off in a log cabin somewhere, you know, 3,000 years ago wanting to dupe us all, right? So, or he was extremely good at what, you know, he was extremely, he had thought everything through, right? Um, but, so, when you're looking at a retelling of a story, and when we're going to look at the life of Jesus, Jesus' life is meant to be something that changes every single person on an individual basis, isn't it? So the life of Jesus is meant to change us. It's not just a pure historical record. And so my opinion, my view, though well studied, and several people hold that view, I won't say it's the majority because it's very hard to say what's a majority anymore. Um, because there's so many people writing about everything, and I don't read absolutely everything, um, believe it or not. There's a lot of people who believe that when you do a retelling of a story, it's actually more effective if you can, when I say the word exaggerate, exaggerate parts, I'm not talking about lying, okay? But I'm talking about an emphasis on something, and you make a greater emphasis on it, then, then maybe, you know, it's like if you're retelling your day and what's the most important thing that happened to you that day? You're going to what? Emphasize that one thing and really want to get people to get this one thing. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they do some of those things where they will take Matthew and Mark, you can line them up, they're talking about the same thing, and Matthew will go off and he'll make this the deal and Mark will make this the deal. Well, to... Who is Mark writing to? We brought up the audience, right? Who is Mark writing to? What is the point he's trying to make? And the third thing I want you guys to consider is many times Matthew has one of Jesus' saying, and it's at the beginning of his ministry. Well, Mark may take that same saying, and he says, no, this is happening during the middle of his ministry, you know, year two. And then Luke may have it at the end of Jesus' ministry. How can you rearrange events and stories? They'll do a lot of things chronologically. Like we just we do things in patterns uh, thematically. Yep, a lot, a lot of it's like thematic. Dealing with this theme, you know, the way that it happens. And especially Matthew, Matthew would be like, here's the parables of Jesus on the, in the kingdom. And so he'll take all the parables that he's recalling of Jesus when he's mentioning parables about the kingdom, and he puts them all together. Now, Matthew may order that near the end of Jesus' life, but it's kind of like when you read the Psalms. The Psalms are picked from, some from Moses, some from Right, David, some from the sons of Gore, they're all over the place, some from Solomon, but we're collecting them and then putting, and then they group them according to theme, right? More than, well, Moses should be Psalm 1. Why? Because his is the oldest psalm. That's, that's not how they ordered things. But here's the second thing, and I'll get to you in a second. Here's the second thing. Do you think Jesus said the same thing more than once? Absolutely. <laughs> Only if he was trying to. Right, when he's in Galilee and he makes a point, do you think he probably, when he was down in Jerusalem, wanted to make a similar point and may not have said it the same way in Jerusalem as he did in Galilee, but is making the same point? And so when they're recording him, aha, look, they're taking this saying of Jesus and it's different. Well, every time you say something, do you say it the same exact way every time you repeat a point? Hopefully not, right? And depending on when you said, I'm going to get to him and then to you. Fix. Oh, well, let's say you and I, we go through something, and, and, and like we go on a, on a mission trip for a summer. Yeah, right? that'd be awesome. When we come back and we're recanting what happened, my recollection is going to be slightly different than yours. My timeline might be a little bit off compared to yours and things like that. You can't get hung up on those little details. But You'll get we don't have the Holy Spirit giving us inspiration. 
That's the, that's the rebuttal. Usually the rebuttal is, but this is the Holy Spirit. Why can't the Holy Spirit get the details on it now? Well, what does inspiration mean? Has anyone thought to think of what inspiration actually means? I'll get this channel before I veer off again. It's really the same thing Gabriel said. It's like listening to Justin speak to his math. I mean, Hayden and Ruth. I'm glad you. It's like listening to Justin. It's different every time I hear it. <laughs> when he's teaching Hayden the exact same math skill he's teaching Brianna, it's, it's, it has to be taught differently because they don't understand it. But it's still the exact same concept. Yeah. You know, and so it's. You're walking it's away with this. They're still going to get to the same conclusion. You're walking away with the same point, right? Or the same conclusion, or something happened. And once again, even though, let's go with Fix's example for a, for a moment. He's retelling something, I'm retelling something. Fix is like, this was the best part of the trip. And I'm going, no, this was the best part of the trip. Who was right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. In addition, uh, when I was teaching, you teach five classes. The same material, Yeah. but sometimes, the second or third period needs a little bit more of section B. And so you emphasize that yeah. versus section A or C. Because you find that your audience needs a little bit more juice. From okay, the area. so let's bring it all together. John helps us out by telling us what his, what his purpose is. Does anyone know what John's purpose is? <coughs> That you, I write, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's his purpose. He states it. We can go back and go, oh, yeah, I see that. But even if he didn't write what his purpose was, should you be able to read it, read the same things and go, I bet you John was writing about this, that means his audience was probably struggling with what? with their faith, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of... So you start to, oh, you start to get an audience. You start. He doesn't always have to tell us who he's writing to. You can get a sense of who their audience is. And, <clears throat> you know, when you're reading Luke, Luke tells us who he's writing to, why he's writing it. Matthew and Mark, there is no purpose statement in Matthew and Mark. There is no, I am writing this to, not there. I am writing this for this reason. It's not there. But as you read it, there are, and what we're going to be doing is looking at some key developments for us to understand <clears throat> who is he writing to, what were they struggling with, okay? What were they going through? What is the thing Mark is really emphasizing? And <clears throat> another interesting thing before we get into Mark. Does anybody know about how many years after the life of Jesus the Gospels are written? 70 AD? 70 AD. 20. You're saying 70 AD? Yeah. Yeah, there's some that are up there. John's probably 70, maybe yeah. plus. There's now, once again, some people have Mark as one of the first. But, you know, mo I'm going to say most scholars, many scholars, that, and I kind of hold this chronology that probably have like first and second Thessalonians and even Galatians written before the first gospels ever written. So what you're saying, what you're saying, what what that you got to understand, well why are they not writing this the year after Jesus has died? Like, you know, that would be the best time to write it, wouldn't it? Now, the reason why Luke is writing so late, does anyone know why Luke is writing so late? He wasn't with the apostles. He wasn't with Jesus with the apostles. He wasn't an apostle. He's sitting around talking to Peter and James and listening to stories. And that's how he gets the book of Acts, by the way. I believe why the book of Acts ends so abruptly and why, if you've seen the movie The Apostle Paul, um, when Luke is writing and he's going and talking to Paul and basically like interviewing him, he wrote up until the point of where Paul was at when Luke wrote that letter. That's why, we, that's why it ends right there in Paul's life, because... It hasn't played out yet. Luke is at this point in Paul's life when he's writing, and it just kind of like, it ends. We don't see Paul's death. We don't, because I think Luke finished his gospel in the book of Acts before Paul ever even died. Um, there are things that may have been added later and all that stuff. But 
So if Mark is writing, let's say 30 years later, there's a reason why it took him 30 years and now he's writing, right? There's a reason why Matthew, you know, maybe even 40 years later, or some people have Matthew before Mark, there's a reason that got him to start writing it down. But for 30 years, all they had was oral, orally. They were telling these stories. So these, story, these stories were being passed around. Right? People, they didn't go 30 years without the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Where were they? They were being passed by word of mouth. Imagine retelling a story 30 years later. Do you think your perspective has changed a little bit? Or 50 years later? I think in our culture, yes. Yeah. I'm not so sure if it was so much so back in that day. <clears throat> What do you mean? Well, you hear, you hear wise people be able to quote the Old Testament, or it is found, or it is written. Yeah. They'll, they'll repeat it verbatim. And they had a way of turning things into songs to remember. Yep. And I think that their ability or strategies to remember are far greater than, than they perhaps are today in our culture. That actually goes to the point of why Matthew probably structured, especially his book, the way that he did. It's very much in a grouping, like, okay, I can remember the parables. We can get these out, right? This parable, then this parable, then this parable. It's almost in a linear, like, a, there's a pattern to it. Well, and think about how much we rely on technology now. I mean, we yeah. don't have to, re we're not forced to remember so many things because we have literally everything at our fingertips, whereas... <clears throat> but a lot of the memorization came from they had things written down they memorized. From what we know, there was nothing written down. Now, I don't believe, I believe there were sources out there. Like, I don't think Luke, or let's say Matthew, the first time he wrote words down about the life of Jesus, if you've watched The Chosen, you kind of see them with like their notepad out, like as Jesus is going. But when they actually compile it, and when they put it together and when they decide to start handing it out is many years later from what we know of why what's the purpose there's something coming up in the life of christians that mark wants to address that matthew wants to address that luke wants to address and john wants to address so i think going into that and reading it like trying to figure out who the audience is you will actually learn more about the book when you try to read it that way like what is mark getting at well, like, what's his major point Go through and read Mark and trying to figure out what does he keep emphasizing? So, if I keep saying we're getting to Mark, let's get to Mark. <laughs> does someone have a hand up? Go ahead. Susie, you got me hanging on there, buddy. You said, okay. what does inspiration mean in your life? Oh, yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. And so, you were asked us, and in my mind, I'm thinking influential, uh, but I got to think spiritually as well. Uh, but I don't know specifically. But uh, it may all entail. Okay. I have a slightly different view than probably what our traditional. Okay. So this is the traditional verbal, plenary, inspiration. Can anyone tell me what verbal, plenary inspiration means? We were told word for word what to say. It is, it is, it is, yeah, every word, every single word is inspired. Like, where they decided to use the word of and the and, okay? Every word. And we get that from a scripture that says, God breathed scripture, right? Breathed it out. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I got something about that, though. <laughs> but when you talk about Scripture being God-breathed, okay, none of these Scriptures existed. They're talking about the Old, Old Testament was God-breathed. Yeah, 1 Timothy 3 is specifically speaking of the Old Testament God-breathed. Right. But I, I believe now, 2 Peter also says that there's no Scripture that was not right. Holy Spirit-inspired men from old. It's still even speaking of... Old Testament. Now there are places in the Old Testament where it says, God, the Lord told me to say, or the Lord said, and I believe the Lord said, I want you to say this, this exact phrase. 
But in the retelling, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in about verse, let's go to, let's start in verse 10. <clears throat> let's see what, um, oh, I like the way. So I'm using a CSB version. I normally read out of an ESV. I decided to throw myself completely off tonight, not just use a different Bible, but also use a different translation. Huh? I know. I don't know where it is. I think it's in Edwin's office. I think that's inspired. That's inspired. Yeah. <laughs> so does anyone know what the NIV stands for? No, no, no. no. Nearly inspired version. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Just like the ESV. <laughs> It's almost inspired. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait, one second. If this is right, every word, every word, why are there so many translations? Which translation is verbally perfect and correct? Why is it when we compare Greek manuscripts, Greek manuscripts differ from each other? I believe if God can, if, if, if this is true, if God has the power to give the exact wording, then he also has the power in the, in the, when they copied it down, if God wanted it, copied word for word exactly so we have every single word exactly the way it needs to be, God has the power to also inspire those who penned it and copied it and continued it. Okay. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Does anyone have your hand up? Let me read this and then we'll talk. Can you hold it? All right. Now, we're not even going to get into Mark. We're not even going to get into Mark. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since the Spirit, it searches everything, even the depths of God. So we are dealing with the Spirit of God, searching the depths of God, the mind or heart of God, depending on... I'm going to hold my NASB up too, but it has a good translation. <laughs> For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? So there's this, there's this constant phrase we're going to see as spiritual thoughts. Who knows the thoughts of God? <clears throat> can, can I say the same thing three different ways, three different ways and mean the same thing? Sure. Let's say I order a sentence three different times, but I have, I have this thought. And it's like when a teacher gives a test. You're asking your students, do you know the information? Are you asking for every student to write the answer the same exact way? And if they did, they were cheating. If yeah. they did, they were cheating. <laughs> if they did, they are cheating. But, sounds like you got thought. <laughs> can there be seven ways to explain the same answer? And you go, you got, you got it because you understand and you know and you got the thought that I wanted. All right. Sounds like common core. <laughs> it's on tape. It's supposed to be a whisper. All right, so watch this. Now, verse 12. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world. So what? What is in here is not from the world. Not the wisdom of the world. Not the mind of the world. Not the thoughts of the world. That's not who we've been writing by. But the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand... What has been freely given to us by God? We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. The NASB has spiritual thoughts to spiritual people. And the point is, is God inspired them to write about the sonship of God. Right? I'm inspiring Paul, and I want you to right to Ephesus, they're struggling with, you know, how they're to live out their faith. And I want you to explain to them how awesome it is that they are in one body, the Jews and the Gentiles and brought into one body. Did Paul do that? Absolutely. Go read Ephesians chapter 2. Could he have said it a little bit different way and still have gotten the thought across and it still have been the inspired word of God? That's what I'm asking. Okay. So inspiration to me I'm not the obviously words matter because words create without words you can't create thoughts right without words you can't create thoughts in the sense of what we read creates the thought so our thought comes from what we read so 
they couldn't have lied, right? They couldn't have lied and got the thought of cross. They couldn't have chosen a word that God was like, no, 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 I don't want that concept being thought. I don't want them to get away with that. I don't want them to think that. I think God has a hand in guiding them, but it's human who God inspires to get his thoughts across. But in a much more way, I mean, you can take this in such a generic way that words don't matter at all, and I'm not saying that. I think the words do matter. But I'm not so sure we go, he, look, at he used this word in this Greek tense in this exact way. Therefore, we create entire doctrines on the word Paul used. And some words are more important than the others, right? Son of man means something. That phrase, son of man, it means something. You could not have gotten that idea across in a different way that because of Old Testament scripture, okay? But when Paul says the word, I'm trying to be careful. Uh, we're not going to go there. Questions? Who raised their hand? Oh, you had your hand raised still. Is it holding it? Are you holding it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was going to say, to go along with what you were saying, just go a couple chapters up in the first Corinthians 7. Paul was talking you know, here about marriage. He spends about the entire chapter talking about marriage. And there's several times in here where Paul differentiates hey, this point, this idea right here is commandments from God. This yep. is what God wants to be done. Yep. Then he separates and says, okay, not I, or not the Lord, but I say this is a good idea. I think we can get from that that he has, Paul has the, uh, the freedom to express an idea that didn't come word for word from God. He has wisdom that came from God, and he has commands that came from God, and he's able to say, hey, God said to do this exact thing. Yep. Now, the wisdom that I have says it's easier if you do it this way. Yeah. Yeah, so Paul seems to know when he's being inspired to write about a topic, and when he goes... There's no real direct command from the Lord dealing with this specific situation. But with the wisdom that I've gained from all the other stuff, he also felt it necessary to add it in and mixed in with the things he says. This is the direct command from God. One husband, one wife, they are not to withhold their bodies from each other. That is, that is of God. But this non-believer who wants to leave, and my wisdom is, Paul's saying, are my words. Here's, here's a good way to handle this situation. Which is funny because we go into that situation, 1 Corinthians 7, and we, we make some doctrines out of 1 Corinthians 7 right after Paul says, these are my words, not the Lord's words. But anyways, let's not get into 1 Corinthians 7. But I think your point, is, your point is, Paul knew when he was being inspired to speak. But then we also have Peter saying, hey, the words of Paul are scripture. Yeah. Yeah. They're scripture. I believe these are scripture. As long as, and I think God can preserve his thoughts exactly the way he wants them. Now, but when you go to the Old Testament, you can see the person who's recording the story of David versus Isaiah who's saying, thus says the Lord, and then quotes exactly what the Lord says are two different, like this is word for word, thus says the Lord, the Lord said this. All right, we've got the words of Jesus, we know he said those. Any questions on that? What I don't want us to go away with from is thinking that the Bible doesn't matter, and as long as you get just the thought, you know, nothing, then, you know, as long as we're getting the idea of it. That's not what I'm talking about either. These thoughts are specific thoughts that if you go too general or too specific, you've lost what God inspired you to do. Daniel and then Justin. The way it's traditionally usually taught versus what it can mean. But I guess to give an example of the way that I think of it, I'm, I've got tests that I've got to do in my classes that they're written responses that are supposed to be a paragraph. Yeah. The interesting thing is the way 
way this professor is laid out is he gives the prompt that we're supposed to write on, but then he's also given a pool of words that we're supposed to make sure that those words are in the response. Now, the response is still my response, and I still have some latitude to use examples that I want to use, Yeah. but I still have to have certain things in it, and it still has to have the meaning that's intended of what it is that I learned in class. And that's why the new American, the NASB has actually spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. And that was my point is there are words, as you said, from the pool that Paul has to draw. All right. When he's calling Jesus, like, like in Colossians chapter one, let's go there for a second. Let's, this will be a good example. Let's go to Colossians one. So we're about to look at all these descriptions of Jesus. The, the way he words these matter. Okay? Watch. He is the image of the invisible God. Maybe the of and the the probably don't matter as much, but the image of the invisible God, he is the firstborn of all creation. That firstborn word is important. The way Because that has a meaning that is attached in Scripture throughout that, would, that was probably one of those, from the words of Poole, I want you to use firstborn, right? Firstborn. Uh, for everything was created by him. You can't really mess that up. You can't really say that a different way. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now, here's one of those. Could he have just said, over all rule? Could we have gotten the same idea? Did he have to have rule, dominion, authority, power? They all have somewhat different nuances. But could he have said that in maybe a different way? Maybe just said three out of the four and still got the idea across. You understand? That's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Those things, if that differed, you would still have the exact point. But the exact wording is what some people think. You know, like it's, it's like somebody, the spirit took over and they just... But then the discrepancies really matter if that's the way Scripture was inspired. Because if the Holy Spirit is guiding every single one of these, okay, was it the ninth hour or sixth hour, the Spirit? If it's the, why are you choosing six here and nine here? You know, or in the Old Testament, you said it was, you know, 10,383 people. He says, you know, this recounting says it's 11,274. If it's the Holy Spirit in every single, then there, I think there are discrepancies. Now, once again, it can be translation how it was repeated all the way down. There's a lot of stuff that can go into this. I just say that transmission, transmission. Is, a separate, is a separate issue from translation. Uh, but <coughs> going back to the verbal plenary inspiration thing too, at the same time, Paul or Peter or Jude or whoever did not say anything God did not want them. Exactly, yeah. So that's the other thing to, to hold as, as part of this. So in that sense, everything that is said is God-breathed. Yeah, it, it's inspired by God. There's nothing in there that God wouldn't want in there. Right? But John also will say things, there are many things Jesus said and did that can't contain in books, but I'm writing these things, so he obviously had some kind of say in what he chose and what seven miracles he picked mm -hmm. To prove that Jesus is the Son of God. And now, if you took Matthew and gave Matthew the same assignment, hey, pick seven miracles. Pick seven miracles to prove Jesus is the Son of God. Are there other miracles that could substitute in for what John did that would have proven the same point? But John had some kind of say in which ones he chose. But he didn't choose any that God didn't want him to choose. Right? So there's. I think it, we're getting it, there. It, it, at a certain point, it becomes a semantic argument. Yes. Well, and here's here's my point. Um, when we start breaking down like words and tenses, and put so much emphasis on a word and a tense, when if it was restated in a different way and had a different tense, would it have changed the meaning? No. But are we holding that one singular word? Now there are times the Bible holds to one word, right? Jesus 
makes the statement of the um, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the am means what? He's presently still, and he used that as a point to the Sadducees that God is, you know, there is a resurrection. He held all that off on one point, on one word. So there's times, once again, people get confused of why there's discrepancies. My way of the way that helps me answer it, and I think that we have some biblical backing, is I don't think the Spirit was, they gave him inspiration. Matthew remembered the story this way. Mark remembered the story this way. Added some stuff. Matthew didn't remember that stuff or chose not to write about that stuff. Or, you know, chose to say they went here first. When Matthew, Mark says they went here first, they're writing it 30 years later, some are 50 years later. Who are they writing to? Does it, is their audience caring about they went here, then here, then here, then here chronologically? Or is there a thematic retelling that matters more? Might as well not get into Mark. I know I said Mark several times, guys. I promise Mark next week. We like to think we're so much different and so much more civilized, better in some ways than the ancient people we read about. But we do exactly the same things that they did. And when they look at Jesus and the things that Jesus did, one of the themes that we have throughout the New Testament is the details that they focused on. You know, Jesus cures somebody of some incurable condition. Yeah. And they're focused on the day that he did it. They're focused on just all the wrong details. And we do exactly the same thing. Well, that's the we Paul. The entirety of Scripture. And we see how incredible is it that throughout 4,000 years, these, all of these different writers made this incredible thematic book that just blends together perfectly. Yeah. And we look at, you know, this word over here. <coughs> well, and Paul will give words. Timothy the warning, don't argue over what? Words and genealogies. And I think there's there's something to be said about about us missing the forest for the trees. Not that the trees don't matter because the trees make up the forest. That's my point with the the words matter because words make thoughts. If you change that word, that thought is changed. So there are words that have to be used to adequately get that thought through. And that thought is more than just, like I said, inspiration is more than God's just wanting you to have an epiphany of a, you know, it's like, it's like when people overly summarize the book of Revelation. Say, don't read the book of Revelation. Jesus wins. That's the end. That's all you, re that's all you really need to get out of it. And I kind of go, ugh. I mean, that's a long book. That's the only thing for us to get out of that. If that's the, I'm not saying that's not the main point, but if that's the only point, that's a long, whole lot of convoluted stuff. Just say, hey, Jesus wins. There was points to it, and those individual chapters and stuff matter. Now, those chapters together create the book, create the thought, all those kinds of things. Same thing with the life of Jesus. If you just walk away from the Gospels and go, hey, Jesus was good. You need to be good. It's just about being a good person. You've missed a lot of thoughts. You've missed a lot of statements of Jesus. That when Jesus was like, good's not just being good is not good enough. Being my disciple is what I'm asking. What's the difference between being a disciple and being good? I mean, there are good people who are not followers of Jesus, right? Who do good things? No? You've got to think about the standard of good. Well, when our definition of good, are there, are there people who go out and can help somebody and they weren't doing it because they were following Jesus? Absolutely. Yes, there are individual things that you can do that are not bad. Yes. And I've met good people. Once again, if you're going the Romans 3 definition of good, nobody's good. That's what, that's, right, that's the legal definition. I'm talking about even the demons believe in shudder right kind of stuff there are people who do good things right the good samaritan who's not necessarily a believer in jesus yet but can do something good and he purposely uses a samaritan even the gentiles do good to those who love them right though they're not believers so they're but if the only thing you get out okay we'll get the next week we'll get right into mark i'm not even going to play with it around we're going to jump into mark i said it tonight 